David. Good to have you uh, on board. This is my first ever interview or podcast. I've done a couple myself, but I've never hosted anything. But it's good to have you on board and thanks for having a chat with us today. Um, I, yeah, I mean, if you could just kick off a bit with a bit um, an intro on yourself. I know you've been in the industry a long time. We've known each other probably since my mobile payment days, which is about seven or eight years ago now. Um, you've obviously been in the fintech industry for four years, won a numerous amount of awards and stuff, but I'd love for you to just kind of give the audience a bit of a, a summary of your career, if that was all right. Sure. I mean, as a, as a quick potted history, I mean, I started off working in, in secure communications. I did a lot of, um, you know, I worked, you know, for NATO and GCHQ and things like that for a consulting company and, you know, domestic uh, satellite work for um, international organisations. So I started off in communications um, round about the time of Big Bang, which is none of your listeners will remember, but so round about the time of Big Bang, um, what happened was that in the in the finance sector, people started to need the kind of secure, reliable communications um, that that I knew a little bit about and my colleagues knew a little bit about, um, and that took us into the financial sector, um, mm. and from there into payments. And I discovered I I liked it. I was just very interested in payments. I liked the kind of mass market retail side of things. Um, developed a lot of expertise in in new payment types and technologies and smart cards and chips and all this sort of thing. That, of course, then went inevitably into mobile and mobile payments and new platforms for payments. Um, and and then, uh, of course, as soon as you start studying payments in any real detail, um, mm -hmm. you run up against the identity problem. And so that led me into thinking a lot and, um, uh, you know, claim a tiny about a bit of credit for, for one or two bits of thinking around the relationship between identity and money and that took me into the sort of more of the fintech space which is where I've I've ended up as a, a you know an advisor to a couple of companies and um, you know I wrote a couple of books and I, I write for some magazines and things so yeah Amazing. so it's uh, it's from comms to finance to payments to identity I guess that's the that's the trajectory yeah. and Dave do you you know, I <clears throat> I remember this quite clearly when I think Contactless for herself came out, mm -hmm. you know, and just picking on that specifically and how yeah. the press were quite, you know, not, I would say quite derogatory towards like the uptake of it and just slowly it's just been growing, growing and growing. And no doubt now it's just incredible the amount of people using Apple Pay and Contactless yeah. and just mobile payments and all that sort of stuff. And is there anything else that sort of you've found sort of surprising the identity piece might be something but is there anything there that you think that is sort of changed much more dramatically than that or surprised well, I think, I you think, more than anything i think mobile really um i mean in a way i kind of wasn't surprised not, not because i'm a genius but we, we were lucky enough to work on a couple of the very early projects in that space around particularly around the very first experiments in mobile contactless the first nfc payments you know, I worked on projects for Orange and O2 and people like that. Um, and I just saw how people reacted to them. I mean, you you gave out these pilot phones for, for and you couldn't get them yeah. back off of people. Like once people had, and so I so it wasn't like I was had a crystal ball or something. I was just sort of observing what was going on. If you rolled it forward to now and said, well, what what is it? You know, it's sort of that you're playing without the corner of your eye now. Mm -hmm. I'd have to give you quite a surprising answer because I think it's NFTs. I yeah, think okay, um, interesting. Yeah, I think people see it as a lot of uh, you know money laundering, criminality, scams, nonsense, stupid pictures of chimpanzees with sunglasses, all of which is true. But as the underlying technology evolves, there's there's something bubbling there, um, the sort mm -hmm. of tokenization of everything kind of thing. So, um, well, did you see? I don't know if you done. saw the. Um, I saw it was it was advertised to me on um, on Instagram quite a lot, and actually one of my friends, two of my friends, actually bought them. But Damien Hurst did a release, a uh, henna release of some artwork, and actually what he'd done is he did the release of his physical paintings of the of these prints, but he also done these NFTs that go with them. So you could either have the physical print or have the NFT, and in two years you could exchange for either or hold on to them instantly sold out which is incredible so people are really 
it's interesting how artists are using them. And obviously, you've got the luxury houses using them as well um, to their advantage. Um, I'm not a professional or I don't fully understand that. I need to go on a one on one course. To be I mean, fair. The art, I mean I, I, I'm just going to sound funny, but in my head, I divide NFTs into sort of two two parts. There's like NFTs, which are essentially useless and don't do anything. And that's mm. art, basically. I mean, art doesn't do anything. It just sort of is. No. And actually, I'm not that interested in that because I, I don't really care about it. Mm. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't have any kind of, I couldn't tell you a Damien Hirst from a Picasso. It's probably not true. I probably could tell a Picasso from a Damien But that's about <laughs> the limit of it. Yeah. Um, you know, I wouldn't have bought the Mona Lisa in a garage sale. So, I mean, I'm not an art person. But um, but NFTs that do things mm. like uh, concert tickets or yes um, mm. open doors or allow you to drive a car or whatever, I'm extremely interested in those. Um, and the financial mm. sector is interested in those because the idea of um, moving sort of assets around without any clearing or settlement points mm. towards a, a much uh, a lower cost of intermediation basically a much a lower cost of delivering financial services so so yeah so it sounds like an odd answer because like, everything in the papers about nfts is just crazy at the moment but mm. yeah underneath that there's there's something bubbling i think that's really interesting it's like house transactions you're seeing it, it could be just the, the the opportunity is endless isn't it which i think why I think we have a long way to go before it's houses, but um, but yes, in principle, you're right. Asset transfer, mm. but you see, for that to happen, you have to have a digital identity infrastructure that's reliable alongside it, mm. and and mm. that we don't have. Well, it's just quite interesting. Changing the subject slightly, I had the NHS app um, alert me that my GP has sent me a message on there, and I just you know that's all just coming into its own. I think that's a it's a great application. It's really great. I mean, the GPs are using it. You can do prescriptions on there. It's it's all becoming in this one hub, if you will, which I think is really exciting. Yeah, I, actually, one of the sort of I mean, nobody would have wanted it this way. I I, I, I you know, goes without saying, but but weirdly, you know, the pandemic has has driven one or two things. So the idea for a lot of people who either couldn't be bothered or just not interested in the technology and that have, have been forced to sort of use some apps and QR codes to get stuff done and have discovered, Oh, actually it's quite mm, yeah. easy. I'm not sure if I want to go back yeah. to it. Like, so, yeah, you know, a lot of those things where you just call up the GP, you know, on the, I forgot what it's called, but, you know, we have the thing on the phone where you call mm. to the GP. I mean, most of the time they tell you to go to the doctor, but sometimes mm. they can just write up the prescription. And you can go around the corner and get it. Mm. You're thinking, well, why weren't we doing this 25 years ago? Well, that's it. And, and, you know, I was in um, I was in London, what, three weeks ago out for dinner with um, seven uh, people I've been with networked. It's like a forum thing I go to. And, they, they, you know, I, I, I know them really well, but we're, we're at dinner. And the way you paid at this restaurant, which was really lovely, was near St. Paul's called Chameleon. And it, it you basically they don't have a PDQ machine. They don't have anything. Basically, you're in this sort of greenhouse thing eating this really lovely food. And then there's a QR code that you all scan and then you go through the payment journey there all on Apple Pay. It's absolutely incredible. And it says, well, how many is at the table? Seven of you. And then it divides your payment up. You want to give a tip and everything. You just walk out. It's it's absolutely the most seamless, great experience of any um, transaction that I've ever been a part of within, within a restaurant environment, that is. I'm, I'm um, having... So having had that experience, I'm sure you didn't collapse with surprise when you read in the newspapers that Worldline has gotten rid of the Ingenico terminals business that they bought two oh, years no, ago. I didn't. Yeah. yeah, no, I didn't. I didn't know that. Interesting. It's, uh, but who would have thought? Who would have thought QR codes would have caught on in the UK? Um, yeah, I think I you know. Certainly wouldn't have done. I, I I still think that um, <laughs> for a lot of these things, um, actually tapping on things is easier than opening the camera and looking at the QR code. But QR codes work. Why argue with the box office? Exactly. That's it. So obviously there's lots of exciting trends in digital you know, financial services at the moment. Um, it'd be great to hear your some thoughts on these. You know, what do you think is the most interesting trend at the minute? Do you think it's open banking and the, the, the sort of applications laying on top? Do you think it's NFTs? Do you think what do you what crypto? Obviously, you know, I saw the, the blockchain co-founder um, and CEO is doing a, 
he's actually, I think he's doing the keynote talk over in uh, Money 2020 America. Um, and it's becoming crypto.com of sponsoring the UFC. It's becoming real headline now in terms of. Actually, you went, to, you, went to, you went to Money 2020 in Amsterdam last yeah. year, didn't you? Yeah. You know, so, I, they really should change the name of that to Identity 2020 because you know, two thirds <laughs> of the stands were KYC, AML, CTF, PEP, transaction risk monitoring, network monitoring. It's like the, the payments bit has got easier and easier and easier. The big block to getting anything done um, is uh, is identification, authentication, authorization now. So, but yeah, well, I mean, I don't know where you want to start on the trends, but I mean, if you start at crypto, um, actually. You know, I'm I'm not exactly a statistical cross section of the industry, but I I, I'm a, I suppose I'm, I'm a useful barometer, I suppose, because of the things I get involved in. Um, and actually, I have to say, most of the actual paid work that I do at the moment to to take care of the rent and put food on the table um, is actually digital currency rather than cryptocurrency. So, because central right. banks have started talking about digital currencies, and you know, the Bank of England have, have started their task forces and work streams. So when the bank, and, and I think, I can't remember exactly, but I think the Bank of England said second half of the decade, so sort of 2026 onwards, they would think about launching it. But of course, 2026 is within the strategic horizon now for, for, for large scale enterprises. So mm-hmm. so a lot of people in that, the same value chain that you're very familiar with, have started to think, well, okay, we're not going to do anything about digital currency tomorrow, but we need a strategy for it like we yeah. we need this, this 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 three to five and it's intellectually quite interesting to look at different businesses and work out well okay if if there's a digital pound and it works like this if there are some digital dollars and they work like that what would the impact on the business be how would our value chain shift i mean one obvious implication of course is nobody's expecting any margins on digital currency mm-hmm. So we, you're not going to make transaction margins. So where else? What adjacencies? Um, so it's it's intellectually very interesting, but it's it's actually mostly digital currency, not cryptocurrency at the moment. I mean, I'm involved in one or two little experiments and startups and things, but mm. um, no, that's super interesting. That is really interesting. I think we're sort of seeing that in the ecosystem as well. Um, you know, ourselves as Tillo, but um, we'll come on to that. Um, but yeah, it didn't surprise me. Well, I think you know, for, 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 for Tillo, it has two. It has two separate strategic threads, doesn't it? Because on on the mm. one hand, there's there's crypto as a payment mechanism uh, that a ski, that needs its own rewards, its own incentives to go with it. So, and then there's you know Tillo in terms of the adjacencies. Like so, if you imagine that the payment margins are going to drop. Uh, you know what can you do around the payments to to give people more value so i think you know it's i think you've got to look at these two, well i'm sure you are looking at these two threads intertwined yeah no absolutely and i think the crypto space in particular i find really interesting and actually just not not just because you know it's a hot topic and everyone's talking about it and it's up and down and everything but actually you know from your perspective you've obviously written not just one book, two books on the, on cryptocurrency. Um, we're seeing in our world um, applications within the crypto space actually using it as a way of giving more to the consumer, building loyalty programs within there. And I think that talk goes back into your point, David, around you know the margins being very very slim. So it's how do they build these programs to be profitable? You know, cash you, you, you know, Most of these. Crypto, a lot of the bigger ones anyway the crypto businesses that have got millions of users have quite unsustainable reward and loyalty programs and that is where we're coming in to help with making them profitable um, and more revenue generating on that front with you know, I think, cash in. yeah you know, I, I, the reward side i think i mean obviously you're right and that's a traditional business when i say traditional that's a business where you're you know very strong mm. so it's traditional to you but i mean there's also the actual kind of interaction with so i can sort of see Okay, if I do so much trading at this exchange or whatever, I'll get some rewards and so on. But actually, you know, I've I've got a few different accounts that I play around with for different experiments with different clients. Um, mm. And frankly, if I could go to the exchange and cash out and get an Amazon gift certificate emailed to me instantly instead of mucking yeah. around waiting for money to go to 
faster payments and uh, you know whatever I'd, I'd i'd be perfectly happy with that so 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 i think there are different points of interaction with crypto all of which are frankly yeah. pretty good for tillo so yeah no and i think you know these as, as it becomes more popular more mainstream you know even my mother and father-in-law <laughs> literally you know they they really are in the dark ages in terms of technology you know they they even mentioned to me two or three months ago you know what's all this stuff about bitcoin do you think i should buy some <laughs> I, <don't, laughs> wait, like, I was like hang on a minute wait till the root what wait did till you the just root say Ian? what did you just say <laughs> he's a bitcoin i'm like hang on yeah, that, you know you don't even know how to make a cup of tea properly or you pretend you don't <laughs> so i make it for you um but it's just it is becoming much more mainstream you're seeing it on the front you know they're, they're spending tens of millions of dollars some of these businesses on um advertising with uh it'd be, before long i i'm in no doubt that we are going to see it on the front of a, foot, a mainstream football uh club shirt i'm in no doubt about it that is very you know obviously the ufc have got crypto.com there and i think you're going to see other brands i think formula coming. one as well yeah formula one as well yeah it's really interesting it's um it's becoming much more mainstream and i think as it develops in this industry, it becomes much more accessible. I think, yeah, there lies the opportunity, obviously, for these sorts of businesses to build rewards and loyalty and all the other stuff that kind of comes with it to keep those sort of customers there because it is a battle to the bottom of in some respects. Well, the, the, these. I mean, I mean, as everybody says, and I, I'm not an expert on this thing, but I do read people who are. You know, mm -hmm. the margins are unsustainable. So as it mm -hmm. turns into a proper business then it's got to look at rewards and loyalty incentives just like any other proper business would. Um, yeah, and it's yeah, that, probably not that far away given the speed at which the competition is accelerating. Mm. Do you think there's any other trends there you're seeing? Um, well, as I say, I mean, you... you know, if you if you look at what's going on in the NFT space and you look underneath it, at the mm. world of decentralised finance and the protocols that are uh, evolving there and the business models that are evolving there, I, I, I definitely think it would be wrong to dismiss that as a as a space, you know, and that that takes us into other. I mean, for example, I, I mean, this sounds absolutely mad, but a couple of weeks ago, I was I was helping to run a, a seminar for a very conservative and traditional financial organization, not a bank, um, mm -hmm. on the metaverse and financial services in the metaverse. And it sounds mm -hmm. crazy that they'd be thinking about something like that, but then you think. I don't know, Microsoft just paid $75 billion for Activision. You know, mm -hmm. this yeah. isn't sort of messing around anymore. Anyway. No. And, yeah. and the ability to, to bring NFTs, uh, in other words, like property that can be owned, into mm -hmm. those virtual worlds is really quite radical. And if you look at mm -hmm. some of the, ver you know, you look at some of the financial services are already springing up there, you know, pawn shops and, uh, I mean, P-A-W-N mm -hmm. shops and... Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you know, mortgages for virtual land and all that sort of thing. Um, it does have to be taken seriously. So, I, so I, I, I'm really interested, and I, I come from the technology side of things, Alex. So obviously, I'm interested to see how the underlying technologies mm -hmm. evolve and develop because they're coming from a different place. They're coming from the world of of cryptography. They're coming from a actually mm -hmm. pretty solid base. So things that sound slightly implausible if you talk about them in normal mm -hmm. business. You know the ability to have zero knowledge proofs, homomorphic encryption, cryptographic blinding. These are actually not new things. These are tried and tested technologies from that space, and they they do open up a new spectrum of business models. So, mm. yeah, do you think it can scale? Do you, do you think there. do you think it's scalable though? Do you think it can really go into the masses? Well, I'm gonna, or I'm going to sound like a broken record on this one because I think it is scalable, but it's not scalable without an evolved digital identity yeah, yeah. infrastructure. And, and mm. until we move to that kind of reputation economy where you can be sure who you're dealing with or you know the, the, you can trust them to deliver things it's mm. it's going to carry on being full of scams and and, and criminality yeah which is sad okay yeah, no good no is definitely one area you're right no nice that's that's really good to kind of understand your sort of thinking on that one you know you've obviously been uh in and around and hearing and seeing this industry evolve massively. Um, and I have too, to be fair, since, since coming into Tillo and, you know, founding this business, but even before, just before that, there was a lot of talk around it. And now with the success of the go cardless of the world, but open banking, um, 
huge key you know buzzword that's kind of going around at the minute um, yeah yeah i think hiroki was talking around this is a once in a generational time um, of, of sort of businesses shifting and using and taking advantage and almost at the start almost of open backing opportunities there but what do you think about the consumer piece here you know what are the benefits i mean i get the benefits the merchants are sort of it's cheaper but what's the benefit to me, you getting your Amex out and not spending on your Amex or Munzo or whatever it might be than using a sort no, of. I think, I think it's more than that. Alec. I think so. I mean, so first of all, for, from a point of view of sort of interesting strategy stuff, mm. actually the, the time when I was working on that with clients actually was a couple of years ago. I mean, that's, you know, there's a lot going on, but it's kind of all under the surface. So people don't see quite how much is, bubbling there but the but the ability to use open banking to deliver you know this this portfolio of, of financial services to people all sitting on top of uh, uh banking i think is i mean there was a there was a i'll give you an example of where the, there was a discussion earlier in the year i can't remember when it was it was at the end of last year because Anne Bowden of Stalin, who is someone I really look up to, I mean, I've met Anne, you know, many times, incredibly impressive person. And she made a, a passing comment that um, open banking wasn't working because the account, you know, account switching um, was right, going okay. down. And I, so I think that's that actually that because that's a bad measure of open banking, because the point about open banking is. I shouldn't have to have umpteen different bank accounts and keep switching between bank accounts to get all the different services I need. I should be able to get the service I want and then just plug it into my bank account. And you already see that emerging. You know, if you look at, I mean, I'm looking at the machine that's next to me, my other, the other laptop, desktop computer I've got here, where I was just doing some other stuff. Mm. You know, I've got Revolut, Wise, you know, all of yeah. these kind of things running. They all work really well. They all do the things I need them to do. And they're all sitting on top of the same old. They're they're all plugged into the same old Barclays bank account that I've had forever, you know. So so I think people don't see what's going on. And there was a there was a U.S. survey from my good friend Jim Roos at Financial Brand, and he pointed out I can't remember the numbers, but I know the is you know if you interview people and say what do you think about open banking, what do you think about allowing third parties access to your bank account, or something, everybody says no, terrible idea, and it turns out. 85% of them have already got plaid connecting their bank accounts to, you know, umpteen other things because they don't see it as a banking thing. It's because it's that world of embedded finance, right? Where you go to get some useful product or service and get something done. And then they say, well, log in using plaid to do this. And, and then people do it and it all connects up for them. So I say open banking, I, I think it's more successful than people think. Uh, I mean, there's already something like 5 million accounts in the UK connected to open banking. Like a few months ago, you know, if you were playing like employees, but, you know, you had to like, you had to find out like how much you need to pay. And then you had to do this funny thing with faster payments. Mm -hmm. You had to put this code number on it or you had to use a debit card, you know, which now, you know, I just click pay from my bank and it just goes to Barclays. I log in at Barclays. I hit OK and that's it paid. So, nice, so, you know, people... Uh, you know, people are a little bit critical, saying, "Well, has open banking really changed?" I think I think they're wrong. I think they don't see how much is bubbling along under the surface, and I don't see. I don't think they see how much it's already being used. If you're talking specifically about PISP, um, you know, um, payment initiation uh, for account to account transfers, in a way, I'm surprised that it hasn't happened a little bit quicker because a lot of retailers now have their own apps. Like I have the Tesco Pay Quick, whatever it's called. And you nip into the Tesco Express and you do the barcode. It does your club card points and, and takes the payment. But it charges it to, to you know, actually it charges it to a credit card. It's quite expensive for them, I think. Um, mm. But I do sort of wonder why I haven't got the message yet from Tesco, which says, actually, there's no real need to use cards. We'll just take the money straight mm. from your bank account. Mm. If you know, Give us permission. Oh, and by the way, we'll give you double club card points if you do that in which case you know a lot of people would do it i'm sure so i'm a bit surprised it hasn't happened a bit quicker but i'm sure it's coming along do you, yeah i was gonna i was gonna ask that do you think that is going to come along now the, the because like the, i was just listening to um this article that um the ceo of go carla Siroki was talking about like now this is becoming much more widely used and accepted and it is the start of this opportunity do you think these applications especially payment giant well 
um, not payment giants, well, payment giants to some extent. I can see Stripe sort of getting into this area big time, but also companies like Tesco doing that very thing. You know, Netflix, I think, trying to bypass and not using the app store, you know, using this embedded finance so it's like to save huge card fees. But say saying that, but like the UK, it's quite low anyway, think, isn't it? I think we do. Yeah, no, I think we, I think I do see it, and I think if you if you talk to a lot of people in the industry, what what they'll say is we're we, we're sort of missing a layer in the sense that what what the big billers want, what the big retailers want, is not to go directly to open banking. What they want is a request to pay mechanism, and the what's called the VRP, the variable recurring payment mechanism. So that what they want to do is sit on top of these standardised mechanisms that that use yeah. open banking rather than the existing card rails and, and actually i mean that's it happened last week you know the the, ch the the chap came around to have a look at the central heating boiler and um and afterwards uh to pay he broke out uh he's got a phone and um i think it was a sum up one of the little bluetooth readers yeah which of course you won't need anymore soon because apple you'll just tap the phone directly um and he had to wave it around a bit because you know he couldn't get the signal whatever network he was on to sort of do that but he just like in a relatively short time, he'll just go to his QuickBooks and say, you know, charge Dave 75 quid. Uh, the RTP will come through to my phone. The plumber's asking you for 75 pounds, yes or no. You hit OK. And the money just goes done like that. Mm. And I think you'll mm. see a bit of a bifurcation. So if I'm if I'm buying stuff from Tesco or Waitrose or, you know, people I've bought stuff from for years and, um, you know, there's a revealed customer experience there, then fine, I'll let them have access to the bank account. I'll take the double points. If I'm buying something from a dodgy shareware merchant, you know, online somewhere, I'll use my card mm -hmm. with all of its protections and chargebacks and, and that sort of thing. I think it's about yeah, airlines. We were talking about this the other day in connection with airlines because, you know, the some of the airlines are doing this experiment with the IATA credit transfer system. I was thinking... A similar kind of thing like i'm you know i'm i'm a british airways gold member for my sins you know i'm on their site all the time talking like if i'm buying stuff from british airways and they say to me can you stop using that damn amex card yeah, just let us yeah. take the money from your bank account and we'll give you triple abios or whatever probably do it you know if i'm booking something from some other airline that i'm not, or a low-cost airline then i'll use my credit card I'm just saying, it's, I think it's a complex landscape. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, for, for familiar billers, you'll go to variable recurring payments over open banking. For uh, one-offs and, and other kinds of retailing, you'll go to request to pay. Um, mm -hmm. But you'll carry on using your card for an awful lot of the time. And I, I can't remember the top of my head, but I think the, the current projections are that account to account is going to take a third of card volume or something. I can't remember exactly, but... Um, you know, I mean, we also remember the UK is a little bit, you know, we we use cards for everything, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, Money 2020 in Amsterdam, you know, they were talking about, you know, the Dutch ideal, which is the online account to account payment mechanism. Uh, is that That's the overwhelming majority of all online payments. Never go anywhere near cards. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, no. um, you know, it's, it's developing in different directions. But I mean, you're right to highlight it, Alex, because... Uh, I think people are, are mistaking the fact that they don't see all sorts of things going on for there's mm -hmm. nothing happening. And that's not true. There's lots of things happening. Yeah, well, we just it, what we are seeing within this open banking sphere is actually enablers or third parties that use open banking to allow merchants to accept, you know, account to account transfers. They're actually building loyalty programs out the back of it, but they're doing it in a really interesting way. And they're doing it just what you just mentioned there on the uh, the BA sort of example. What they're doing is they're looking to service brand affiliations that sort of they feel will work quite nicely within the transaction. So let's say you're shopping on ASOS. Um, they will service um, a gift card, actually, that will be for Deliveroo. And it will say that, you know, if you your bus is at £75. If you spend an extra £15 more, we'll give you £5 as a Deliveroo gift card to go and get yourself a little treat. And it's the same sort of premise as the BA example there. It's saying that once spend thresholds get to a certain level, they're then servicing sort of opportunities there um, to increase basket spend, brand affiliation, and then that loyalty piece that comes into it all. 
if 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 you're buying something online for a hundred quid and the merchant's going to spend three pounds on the card transaction or whatever it is, um, or they can spend you know twenty p, well it's more than that. So they say fifty p on an open banking transaction, give the customer a pound back and split the difference. You can, you know, you can see it works out. And I, I mean, I, but I think to your point, the the delivery example I think is is a good one because. I think, in fact, as your experience has shown, your you know your growth has demonstrated this. Um, for a lot of customers, they attach more value to the five pound delivery voucher mm -hmm. yeah. than given being given four pound fifty off, which would be the margin spread on it. So, mm -hmm. you know, the merchant because obviously the merchants aren't paying five pounds for those delivery vouchers. The, the the cycle there, I think, works quite well. It's probably more explicit on the BMPL side of things than the card side of things, but. But yeah, absolutely, you're right. I mean, it's, it's, this is a really interesting area for growth. Yeah. Do, what What do you think in terms of uh, this Section 75 protection for consumers? Do you think that will come into play for open banking, or do you think do you think it will just be that's the risk that you take and that you sort of um, no? I think, I think it will be. I think it will be unbundled. So. Um, mm -hmm. Like I say, I mean, I don't need Section 75 chargebacks at Waitrose. I'd rather have cheaper prices. You know? <laughs> yeah, like I know. Exactly. If, no, because like if I if I come back like Waitrose only around the corner, if I, I come back from Waitrose, that. if I come back from Waitrose, you know, with some mints and it's off, I'll take it back and they'll give me another one. I don't need Section yeah. 75 yeah. to sort all that out. So, no, it makes sense. Um, so I think those things need to be. The, and, and, and because, you know, the merchants become so competitive with these areas, I think those things will become unbuttered. But that's why I say it, it it's not a universal solution because, because there's an awful lot of things where I will still use my car, so I don't have to think about it. Right? Mm -hmm. But if my you know, if you think for the average I can't remember the figures of the UK, but I think for the average household, I think there are five merchants that take ninety five percent of weekly household spending. So so basically in our house in terms of sort of discretionary spending during, you know, it basically goes to Waitrose, Tesco, Boots, Shell, and mm -hmm. Martins, the news agent. I mean, that's it, right? Mm -hmm. So if those guys, and those are people I use all the time, I don't need, I don't need Section 75 chargebacks for those people. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. That does, that does make sense. Well, you, you mentioned just a minute ago, David, you know, buy now, pay later. You know, this is just a, mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm so fascinated with it. Um, you know, the the PR, the power, the weight behind the industry leader, which is Klarna and what they're doing and the lobbying that's happening within this space. You know, there's such an it's 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 exploded within a few years. What's your opinion on on these platforms? And, you know, can they encourage consumers think... to spend with them more than traditional planners? Like what? Why would I again? It goes back to open banking. Why would I use my Amex? over and beyond this buy now pay later option why would i use klarna over an amex or you know vice versa i mean you for you I'm probably like me it's the points i'm going to get on my amex that's why i'm going to use my amex over buy now pay well, later klarna, well i also use my amex because it's extremely reliable i trust it i mean again it's to do with mm. revealed customer experience the couple mm. of times in my life i mean i i'm very old school i literally i you know remember the old advert you'd never leave home without it i wouldn't i would never leave that i would never go anywhere without my amex card because my revealed experience is the couple of times in my entire working life when I've absolutely needed it, when my wallet got stolen or whatever, Amex were one hundred percent. They were fantastic, you know. So, so part of it is revealed experience, but part of it is also the shopping journey. I mean, if you look at, I mean, Klarna is a fantastic example. Everybody knows um, how clever they've been with their acquisition strategy. You know, their their end game is to become the sort of super app, not 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 a payment mechanism. Um, so people start their shopping journeys in Klarna. It's not that they go shopping and then finish up with Klarna. You know, Klarna are already pushing it the other way around. So, you know, you look at your offers and, and um, go to different places. So I think I'm not the only genius that's predicting that, you know, there's going to be a regulatory tightening. You know, it, it, you know, the figures speak for themselves. There are there are some people who have overspent um using the mechanism and may not completely understand the difference between merchant funding and credit and all this sort of thing um yeah. so uh yeah so things are going to tighten a bit there but actually for some of the big players they they they're becoming successful because they're reorganizing the the, the customer journey and um yeah. 
Do you think that's it? Do you think that's why they've done <clears throat> extremely well over and beyond putting on a credit card? Do you think it's the customer remember, journey is just so much more superior? Remember. Yeah, well, I can't remember which, but I remember sitting through a presentation it was three or four years ago. Was it after pay or something? I can't remember, but I remember sitting through a presentation where the and there's a very good presenter uh, talking to the this group, uh, which included merchants, and and finished up saying, you know, we're we're not bringing you another payment mechanism, we're bringing you another customer, and I thought, you know, what a fantastic line, you know, which whoever yeah. Sarchi or whoever came up with that for them um, deserved all the money because the yeah. the merchants loved it. And they and and I think they've they've largely they've held up on that promise, haven't they? Really. So, if you look at the sophistication of what Klan is turning into, but but the other stuff they're building around the the payment experience, it's impressive. There's no doubt about it. No, absolutely. And I think there's some really cool things that they're shaking up within the industry, which is why you know I used it to buy my Peloton, and I thought you know do I want to part with two and a half thousand pound in lockdown i thought no not really i don't i quite fancy just paying in no interest and just getting the bike and paying an extra 50 quid and it's sort of done and dusted and then i found out that like i think it was 30 percent of peloton's revenue was actually free of here klarna and that doesn't surprise <laughs> me because it's made accessible to the to the masses i mean they've obviously had their own issues peloton but i think the point is is it it's helping reorganize finance as how you mean i mean you, it, it Another example would be if you buy quite an expensive coat or you buy I don't know, some ties for your car or whatever it might be, and you haven't had them fitted or delivered yet, why should you pay for it Im immediately? You know, you might not want to pay until you're actually really happy with it. And that gives you the flexibility as a consumer to, to do that. And then they, I just saw on the news um, only the other day, actually, that Klarna is now rewarding with the loyalty program with gift cards. But the really cool thing that they're doing is they're rewarding their consumers for paying early or paying on time which i think is that's really cool that's really nice that's what hmrc should do instead of sending me these letters you <laughs> yeah. haven't paid your vap bill, which you don't even know anything about you're completely forgotten yeah. they should send you nice letters but otherwise, if you pay it on time you know you'll get some amazon points or something mm, yeah no exactly they set about doing things very differently and they set about doing this uniform platform for all so this loyalty program they want to make accessible wherever Klarna is, 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 is being offered or is in a country, which I think is a really bold move. And that's what they want to offer. There's some real complexities there with especially brands, gift cards in different countries and the mechanics of how that works. Um, but I just think it's really smart the way that they've also, they're not precious around, and a lot of buying I pay for later companies are sort of following suit. They're not precious on the brands that they put in their loyalty program given that they might not be working with them. So like, for instance, they'll offer Amazon vouchers in there. Amazon is not accepting Klarna. Amazon probably will never do that with Klarna. But they know, Klarna know that their shoppers will shop at Amazon. So they're offering those yeah, brands yeah. in there. They're not particular. They're putting the brands that they love in there, which I think is super interesting. And more to the point, it's letting um, Klarna potentially work with merchants that they might not work with in time, which I think is super interesting because there's so many guises of this buy now, pay later now. There's this MasterCard thing with Zilch and they're doing their own thing. You can, you can basically buy now, pay later, anything, anywhere. Obviously, Klarna is only accepted in certain stores, which I think is is, is interesting. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's definitely a space that I think is going to... Uh, it's going, to, it's going to become more tightly regulated, as you say. I also think that um, as this sort of increases in brands, I, I, I can see brands themselves doing it themselves. I don't know if anyone's doing it themselves yet, but I can imagine an Amazon's going to do it themselves. They've got enough money to do that, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then potentially Tesco, I don't know, but they could potentially do that in time, um, which will be interesting. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. I think that the retailers have a you know reasonably sophisticated view of 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 the customers and you know the services that provide them with more data you know like Klarna are inherently more attractive I think than alternatives so you know without without repeating the sort of it's all about data mantra um, it, it sort of is all about data so the decisions won't be made pure it, it, you know it's like, is payment mechanism A cheaper than payment mechanism B? That's only part of the calculation, isn't it? It's 
It's, you know, what data do we get? How can we serve customers better? How does it fit with the customer journey? It's it's all that sort of stuff nowadays. And, and of course, yeah. as it goes over to apps and things like that, you can make those journeys more sophisticated and, um, and yeah. better for the customers as well. So. Well, David, thank you so much for, um, you know, coming on board to, to give a little talk and give us, a, you know, your uh, a very experienced view on some really interesting topics here today. Buy now, pay later, open banking, crypto, NFTs. Um, I really appreciate your time as, as always. But just You're to end welcome. on a bit of a soundbite, what, what do you think is the, the greatest opportunity that, that branded currency um, offers for fintech organizations today? It's the connection with the customer, isn't it? Because when you talk about branded currency, you're not, you don't mean like random brand. What you mean is brands that mean something to the customer, you know, like that Deliveroo example you gave earlier on. Yeah. So it, 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 it's what customers already want to do. Like it's their revealed preference and, and you're fitting in with it. So I, I, it looks really good to me. It really does. Nice. No, good. Thank you, David. Um, appreciate your time again but yeah no thank you and uh, yeah, no until next time